Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, right, so the first thing I got asked to go through was uh, the effect of the Fleming stuff. Um, so we'll do that. The actual whole, um, first of all, the th kind of three topics which uh, form part of uh, this paper are forces, which is quite a big, meaty topic, um, waves, and then uh, magnetism and electromagnetism. Now, given the fact that uh, you kind of want me to go through um, the motor effect, I might as well do the whole topic because it's actually really small. Um, electromagnetic waves, we can make sure we get to. In terms of uh, energy transfers, I'll be honest with you, I don't think there's really that much. Um, obviously, I, I teach uh, year 11 uh, chemistry, so that's the one I'm more kind of, I know the finer detail, but I can't think in here really where energy transfers comes into it. There's a whole unit on energy, which is paper one. Um, so let's do uh, the motor effect. Okay, so uh, first of all, we have to look at a, uh, a magnet, okay. Uh, the first thing to is that there are two poles to a magnet, a north and a south, okay? And uh, we have the kind of uh, rule that opposites attract and uh, like poles repel. So if I have two south poles together, they repel, and if I have two north poles together, we attract, okay? Now, you've probably done the uh, experiment where you get iron filings and you can um, use this to see um, the uh, field of a magnet. So uh, let's take uh, a magnet. Okay, now what would happen is you dust on the paper, okay, and um, you, would, uh, you would see uh, these kind of field lines kind of happening. Okay, so um, you can think of these almost as, as kind of big loops which don't quite make, uh, make it round. Okay, now what is a magnetic field? Okay, it's uh, the area in which you uh, can feel a magnetic force. Okay, so in this area, okay, you can feel a magnetic force. Um, the, uh, the field lines come out from the North Pole, okay, and into the South Pole. That's just convention, okay? There's no real rhyme or reason to it. We just draw it that way. Uh, the way to remember this is uh, Nansen, okay, which is uh, north, out, south, in. Okay. Um, oh, Fanny, you've let the side down. I feel really hurt. It's all good. So, a bit of ASMR there, cheeky coffee. Um, so, we're at this point. Um, one other little side thing that they sometimes do is they use, instead of iron filings or anything like that, they might use like a plotting compass. So that's like a really tiny compass. And um, if you think about a compass, you have kind of a, uh, a needle like this, right? Now, the north of the compass will follow the field lines towards the south pole, okay? Because if you think about it, opposites attract. So the north pole of the magnet will point towards the south pole. Uh, sorry, the north pole of the compass will point towards the south pole of the magnet. Right. Um, so we're there um, with that at the moment. Uh, the other thing to do with kind of permanent conventional magnetism to think about is that there are three magnetic elements. They are iron, uh, nickel, and cobalt. Now, the easiest one to remember is I think everyone should hopefully remember that iron is magnetic, 
and the next it's the next two elements on the periodic table. So if I look up iron on the periodic table, it's got a symbol Fe, and you've got CO and then Ni. Okay, so uh, that's those three kind of permanent magnetic metals. Right, why have I gone through that when you want to do motor effect? That's because we're going to build it up, okay? Those key principles still apply for the motor effect. So the next idea is what an electromagnet is, okay? So an electromagnet is a mat, is uh, so my day did some research, discovered that if I have uh, an electric current, okay, I generate a magnetic field, which is really nuts, okay? I know it's bizarre and you probably just have to think about it, but that's really weird. Like the, the, the wires which power like a hairdryer, okay, like that same thing is exactly the same force as what keeps a fridge magnet on. That's really weird. So what he did is he noticed that you can make this uh, magnetic field stronger in three ways, okay? So if it talks about the three things that you can adjust to make an electromagnetic stronger, okay, they are the three Cs. Okay, first of all, you can use a stronger current. Okay, the stronger the current, okay, the bigger the magnetic field. Hopefully that makes uh, sense. Next thing I can do is I can coil the wire. The more turns or coils on the wire, the stronger the magnetic field. And the last one is I can wrap it around to kind of like a, a, a metal core. So if I take uh, one of those magnetic metals, iron, cobalt, nickel, and I kind of wrap the wire around it, it kind of concentrates, in inverted commas, uh, the magnetism. So I've got a stronger electromagnet. Now, he worked this out, a lot of it, with uh, a component which they mention in the um, in the uh, specification called a solenoid. Okay. Now you can think about this as kind of like an electromag. It's an electromagnet basically, which looks like a bar magnet, like a normal kind of permanent magnet. So what they do, okay, is let's use orange for the wire. Uh, they take the wire. Okay, and if you coil it like this, okay, that is a solenoid. Now, if I draw the magnetic field lines here, okay, they kind of go through the coil, they're kind of uniform straight, and then that's exactly the same, notice, as. Um, as the bar magnet which we drew earlier okay they are exactly the same okay and that's what a solenoid is okay so it's an electromagnet kind of coil we can make it stronger in these three ways um, and it produces a magnetic field which looks like a bar magnet now the other key thing uh, to do this is the um, and I know it probably quite obvious is that electromagnet Okay, it can be switched on or off, which permanent magnets cannot. Right, now we're in prime kind of location to work out the motor effect. So I have been getting there, I haven't been kind of dawdling, right? Because this coil makes a magnetic field, uh, the lens uh, the lens diagrams is triple, okay? And I'm, I'm aiming at it combined, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Um, if I have time at the end, maybe I'll quickly uh, go over it. Um, I'm not promising anything though, because uh, yeah, this this is primarily for the people I teach, um, and they don't do triple, unfortunately. But you know, everyone can tune in. Um, because I've got the permanent magnet and I've got this electromagnet, you can see that they so I've already said the opposites attract. So. I can start to kind of stick up, I can kind of repel them. Okay, why is it lagging so much, Chris? Because my internet's rubbish. Um, so, <clears throat> if I uh, get an electromagnet and I get a normal magnet, they kind of go away, right? And this produces movement, repel repulsion or attraction, which generates, uh, which can do the motor effect, right? 
So let's take a, uh, a magnet, right? Where I'm gonna say I have a safe pole here, and a north pole here. So that, uh, actually let's do this nice and big. Right. Okay, and then uh, often that will be in kind of like this uh, kind of metal kind of U-shaped thing like this. Um, right, so uh, what's the magnetic field going to look like in here? Well, remember we talked about Nansen, okay, uh, north out, south in, and there's going to be an attraction, so the lines are going to link. So basically there's going to be a magnetic field in a straight line cross between these two poles. Okay, happy so far. Um, is this foundation? Uh, so the, the basic kind of the wire moves is foundation. The full Fleming's left hand rule is higher. Okay, so the mo how electric motors work is higher. The idea of the motor effect is foundation as well. So um, so that that's basically the idea that uh, current and fields can come together to make a force. So I've got this kind of uniform kind of uh, magnetic field here. So now I'm gonna take a wire, I'm gonna draw this in purple, okay? And I'm gonna put it through the middle like this, okay? I'm gonna take my battery. Now a weird thing about electricity is even though um, it flows in, um, the electrons flow from negative to positive, because Thomas Edison took a punt and he got it wrong, okay, electric current flows actually from positive to negative. You don't need to worry about that too much. The current will be labelled. It should be. Um, if it's not, that's super hard. So the current is going to go this way, okay? Now, remember what we said about electromagnets. Anything which has an electric current generates a magnetic field. So this electrical current in this wire is going to generate a magnetic field. I've already got an um, a magnetic field here, so I've suddenly got two magnetic fields interacting, and I'm going to get some form of attraction slash repulsion. So, how can I work this out? And you use Fleming's left-hand rule, okay? Now, um, I always like to think about this as uh, kind of teachers who want to pretend to be down with the kids, okay? And they do like kind of, like, and they do like, like this kind of rat, bad rap hand here, right? Now, I'm actually going to write on my fingers, okay? Um, so the first finger is going to be the field. Okay, first finger, field, right? What that means is, okay, so you can have first, field, right? F and F. The second finger, the way to remember here, is the big C. God, my hands are horrible. Um, is current. So I'm going to line that up in the direction of current. And the thumb, oh dear, is going to be the force. Okay, high tech this. Right, how do we do this in practice then? Well, what I always like to do is I like to start with my first finger, the field, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to point it in the direction of the magnetic field, so north to south, like this. Bosh. Now, obviously, this is 2D. I'm trying to draw, hopefully, you can get this idea that it goes into the page. Fleming's left-hand rule is is not foundation. Fleming's left-hand rule is higher. So um, the wire comes, uh, I'm trying to show the current kind of going into the page, right? So first one I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my first finger and I'm gonna line it up with the magnetic field, following the arrows. I'm then gonna take my other hand, because this is what makes it easy, easier, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold the end of my finger. That's a physical reminder for me that I'm now no longer gonna do anything like this. I'm locked in place in that direction. I can spin, but I cannot kind of twist or do anything like that, right? So my first finger lines up the field. I then, I'm gonna take my second finger at right angles, okay? Now, current, now can you see that the current is going kind of into the page? So I'm gonna twist like this. My current is gonna go into the page, right? Let's take it right in the middle, I think something really 
Okay, so it might, it's going into the page. And that leaves my thumb pointing downwards. Okay, that means that the force on this wire is going to go down. Okay, that wire will move down. As soon as I turn it on, it will go boom like that and go down. So the key things to Fleming's left hand rule is that the first finger is the field, the second finger is the current, and the thumb will point in the direction of the force. Uh, there we go. Okay. Put the first finger in place, going from north to south, lock it in place with your finger, and rotate as necessary. So in this case, the second finger goes into the page, and that leaves my thumb pointing down, and that means the wire goes down. Now, obviously, if I switch the battery round, the current will now flow in the other direction. So if I imagine the current flowing in the other direction, okay, then that means that the, the current will now flow kind of that out towards me, and that means that the wire will move up because the force is now pointing up, okay? So changing the direction of the current will change the direction of the force. If I, equally, if I flip the magnets around, it means that the wire will again go in a um, different direction because I'm now, instead of pointing, it's going like that. The key thing to remember is it must be your left hand. I know it's kind of would be really convenient to do my right hand, but I can't do that, okay? It's, it's Fleming's left hand rule, not right hand rule. Okay, so that's the motor effect. How does that then translate into how a motor works, right? Well, let's take that same kind of setup, right? Let's take, uh, oh, what, what was that? What is that? Amateur hour. Mm. I mean, I don't know why I'm really calling amateur hour. I'm just sitting in my pajamas in my house. It's already amateur. Oh, this is shocking. Absolutely shocking. Right. Let's focus on what we need, which was north. South. And that means that we've got a magnetic field like that. Now, uh, yeah, Brett, I'll do that um, in a bit. Okay. Now, remember we said that the uh, the ways I can make a, a, a magnet stronger, an electromagnet, is by uh, changing the current, the number of coils, um, or the core. Okay. So, if I take a coil of wire, right, and I put it into the into here, right. So I'm going to take a nice coil of wire. It's going to go in there. Uh, da, 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 da. Go here, and I've got a coil of wire like this. Okay, so I could. I could build it up and have more, a bigger coil like that. Many, 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 many coils. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Nah, you can't have that. And don't use the word gay as an insult. You're better than that. I wouldn't put it on this guy. This guy is awful. Um, right. So the uh, the current, okay, let's just come on going back that way. So um, let's do our Fleming's left hand rule then for each bit of this coil. Now remember, first finger field, that's going that way. Okay, second finger current, that's gonna go up to the page and that means that my thumb is pointing down. So the force on this side of the wire is gonna point down, okay? Um, uh, funny because nerds will uh, nerds will be paying your bills. Um, so the first thing uh, uh, points this way. So I look at this one. Okay, the current coming out at me, and my thumb is pointing up. Okay, um, and that means that uh, the force on this side of the wire points up. So as soon as I turn that on, this side of the wire, given Fleming's left hand rule, wants to go down. 
this side of the Y given flow in Z tangent wants to go up. Um, so that means, uh, yeah, I love Free Willy. It's a great movie. Um, and uh, designed for kids, just like people who use the word Willy still. Nice. Um, so, left hand rule goes down, right hand, uh, right hand goes up, and that means I've got that in twist. Okay. Now, if I imagine it, that it twisted all the way round, right? So let's imagine I twisted it all the way round. Okay. Let's imagine I twisted it all the way round. Um, then the coil, We'll uh, now have uh, the current, uh, so imagine I've now flipped it all the way around. That means that that is still going that way and that one's going that way. Now, what that means is, is because they're going in opposite directions, remember I've changed, compared to this, because it's flipped over, the uh, current is going in uh, direction. That means the force will go in the opposite direction. So that means that would now go up and that would now go down. So straight away we've got a problem, right? So I've flipped it right around because what's happened is the force here goes up, the force here goes down, and it kind of goes whoop. Okay. Now, when I get all the way around, the forces are now in the other direction, so it will go back, right? So in this case, it will start going like and just settle kind of uh, vertically because it's going to kind of flip backwards and forwards. Okay. Like that. Um, so. Um, What's the uh, what's the solution here? Because obviously we have motors, we don't have um, just kind of flip in betweens. Um, what actually happens is that we design our actually let's, let's go back here. Um, we design our co uh, our coil to have something called a commutator, right? These kind of bright. And what that means is, is can you see that here, so this, this one here is positive and this one here is a negative. Um, we have to do the other way around. Anyway, um, the point is this, right? When they touch that plate, okay, this kind of, this commutator, the current will flow. As I get the forces and it turns, can you see that at this point, the coil will disconnect from the commutator so it will just kind of spin on its own freedom. And then what happens is it will then touch the other side. And because the uh, because it will uh, touch them in this way, the current will be going in the correct direction. So it will keep spinning in the same way. That's quite a tricky way to get in your head. But here, when I had just connected them up, it flipped over. And then because now the current's pointing in the other direction, it flips back and we kind of get into this point. Um, here, these commutators, what it does is it changes, um, it changes the direction, and now we can get a motor spinning. Um, it is for combined. This bit in particular, okay, is for um, this bit in particular is higher, okay. Where is he? He can just go away. Awesome. Okay. So uh, that is Brett, and actually kind of everything to do with electromagnetism and magnetism. Now, uh, Brett, I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure um, you asked about the um, the waves, okay? And we also had something earlier about electromagnetic waves. So let's build it up, okay? Now, um, that brown, I can't believe you use that brown. That's like vomit colour. Um, right. Um, waves. At waves, there are lots and lots and lots of key terms, and they key terms you just kind of need to be familiar with. Okay, roughly there are two types of wave. Okay. Ones like that. 
And we've got ones where we kind of get these regions of squishing, regions of spreading out. Like that, okay. Uh, Mighty Manners, got to at least be a place there, isn't it? Well, I'm not a performing monkey. Um, let's put some uh, some key terms on. Okay, down here, where it's all smushed together, that is called an area of um, compression. Okay, here, where it's all spread out, that's actually got the technical term rarefaction. Okay, that just means, it's kind of the opposite of compression, it just means spread out. Okay, up here, okay, this bit here is commonly referred to as a peak, and this bit here is commonly referred to as a trough, okay, uh, like what um, animals eat of, out of. Now, here you can see that the wave oscillates, that means breaks, okay, um, goes up and goes down, goes up and goes down, i.e., okay, it goes up and down whilst the wave is going this way, okay? Um, here, okay, you can see that it's going squash, stretch, squash, stretch, squash, stretch, okay? Squash, stretch, squash, stretch, squash, stretch. So the vibrations, or what we call oscillations, okay, are moving in this direction whilst the wave is moving down here. Now, the easiest way to remember which one is which, these transverse and longitudinal, is to use what I've just done. You can see here, that is a T for transverse. And this here kind of looks like an L for longitudinal. So if you're ever stuck, look at how it's oscillating and therefore um, you can uh, write it on. So this one up here is a transverse wave. This one here is longitudinal. In terms of technical terms, okay, um, this uh, what we this does what we say uh, what we call it oscillates perpendicular, i.e. right angles. And this one here, um, the longitudinal, oscillates um, parallel. Okay. Now, from now on, I'm just going to label uh, the, uh, actually, no, let's, let's label them both. Um, there's something called the wavelength, okay? Now, that's the length of one wave, right? Now, there's, um, the way to measure this is you pick one point in the wave and you go all the way through, okay? Um, you don't have to worry about electricity, about AC current and all that jazz. Um it's all to do with an oscillation of energy, because if you think about it going backwards, it still is um, doing some form of energy. Yeah, it's weird, basically. Anyway, you take uh, the, uh, the peak of one, and I take the peak of another. That there is one wavelength. I could take the start of a wave here, and I could take the kind of end of wave, because you think it's gone up, down, and back to the middle. That there, too, would be a wavelength. I could take a trough to a trough. That there would be a wavelength, They're all the same. It doesn't matter what point you pick, as long as you put in one complete wave. Right? What does one complete wave look like? Okay, we start at the start, at the middle, what we call the equilibrium point. We go up to a peak, go down to a trough, and back to an equilibrium point. Okay, that is one wave. You can see here, I fit it in by going, starting at the top, going down and back to the top. Here, I start in the middle, and up, down, and back to the middle. Here I start at the bottom, went all the way up to the top, and all the way back to the bottom again. Happy days. Okay. Um, right. I think you're getting things confused there, right? You can still have foundation and higher. Um, just some, uh, there's combined means dual award, you get two GCSEs, and triple means you get some extra stuff in it, but then you get a third GCSE. Um, right. The other thing to label on here is what we call the amplitude. Now, be very careful, tube is not from the, all the way from the top to the bottom, okay? If I draw through here, this here, um, as I said, it is what we're going to call the equilibrium point. That's what it oscillates around, pardon me. And the amplitude is from this equilibrium point to the top of a peak, or equally 
from the equilibrium point to the peak of a, you know, the bottom of a trough, okay? The, that there is its amplitude. So don't get lured into the false sense of security that goes all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom. Now, can I label that potentially here? Um, it's harder with longitudinal, which is why I don't think they're gonna ask it, but I'll put it on there just in case, because it's a type of annoying thing that AQA do, because we all love AQA. Okay, if I take uh, this uh, area of compression here, and I take this area of compression here, that's almost like having a peak and a peak. So this distance here, okay, would be a wavelength. Okay, there's some other technical terms which we're gonna bung on this one page. Why have I picked so horrible colors? Who uses brown and gray? Let's see it up. Right, um, PS4 trophy hunting, going well. 189 platinums at the moment. Uh, I think I'm 700th or something at the moment in the UK. Anyway, uh, da, 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 da. right, mechanical wave. Okay, um, a mechanical wave can apply to either one. So the two main types are longitudinal and transverse. What a mechanical wave is, is it needs a medium, or what we're gonna say, I'm gonna call stuff all right what do i mean by that okay um a water wave needs water right that sounds stupid but you can't have a water wave without water right sound needs stuff to travel through right you can't transmit a sound wave if there's no air or there's no solid to transmit the thing there we're not getting into is water wet, it is wet, I'm not dealing with that. Um, that's why you don't have any sound in space. There's no air or any particles to transmit. And in fact, all longitudinal, so mechanical waves. Um, so I mentioned them there, okay, the Arkham is a longitudinal wave, okay? Um, so, Key terms so far, longitudinal, that's the squash, squish, squash, squish one. Transverse, down, wave is something which needs stuff. Now, some transverse waves are mechanical, some longitudinal ones are. But the key ones which aren't mechanical, i.e. they don't require a stuff, are electromagnetic waves. Okay, now these are transverse waves, and the, what they are is they are oscillations in the electromagnetic field. You don't worry about that. What you have to do now is all the different types of electromagnetic wave. Okay, so we start off with radio waves. Okay, then we have microwaves. I'm not going to sing the song, uh, mainly because I, I, I kind of wouldn't want to copyright ping. Um, we're going to then go with uh, infrared. So I should probably have done red. Oh well, let's do infrared. Oh, I hate, I hate yellow. Um, visible light. Uh, ultraviolet. Rays. and gamma rays okay now why have i picked that okay because um we're hopefully familiar with the rainbow right um and it's important that we kind of get the idea in right these are you're familiar hopefully with the rainbow being all um all colors um they're all different versions of of light, right? Red light, blue light, green light, they're all versions of light. These things here are also all versions of light. The problem is, is your, your eyes only see this word visible, right? Your eyes only see, but these are just different versions of light. So radio waves are really long waves, okay? Microwaves are a little bit shorter. Infrared is a little bit shorter 
still. Okay, visible light is getting shorter still. Okay, ultraviolet starting to get quite short. Okay, X-ray is starting to get quite even shorter still. Okay, and gamma rays is like like that. Okay, so what is changing? Okay, well here we've got these really uh, long wavelengths. And over here, I've got really short wavelength. Okay. And the opposite is true for frequency, okay? These ones here have a very low frequency. And these ones over here have a very high frequency. Now, I haven't actually talked about frequency. So let's define that, okay? Uh, frequency. is a number of waves per second. Yeah, I'm streaming off an iPhone then because I don't have enough money to buy a camera yet. Do you want me to, do you want me to dial? Let's do that. Look. Ooh, darkness. How about that? Mm. So, frequency is number of waves per second. Over here, they're really long waves, but they don't have many of them per second. Over here, they're really short waves, but you get lots of them um, uh, every second. Now, um, here's the key thing of electromagnetic waves, okay, is that they all travel at the same speed. Okay, and that speed is the speed of light. Okay. Um, okay, that speed is, uh, uh, yeah, through a vacuum, yeah, but... Um, I'm doing it for foundation here. I didn't really want to go into the quantum uh, mechanical ideas of that through a vacuum. Cherenkov radio. Actually, no. Apparently, Sonic the Hedgehog can go faster than the speed of light, which is bizarre. That it is um, vacuum. Okay. Um, right. These are all um, as these are not. Okay. So um, you can see. Um, you can see uh, the sun, right? And there's nothing. That is all to that. Now, we also, related to that speed, okay, um, frequency times wavelength, okay? Um, what is the best revision for the morning? Um, what is faster than light? Nothing is faster than light. In a vacuum. So frequency, length, how long the waves are, and it doesn't matter where I pick, because this is a big number and this is times together, it's the same number as this one, which is really small, and this one, which is really high. So see how they all have the same. Right. Um, the, other, the other thing you need to know with waves is a use for them all. Funny enough, radio waves, it's used in the radio. Microwaves, used for microwaves. Infrared, now this is kind of the heat one. Okay, so you can... Um, you can uh, detect it, and you can see what uh, heat comes off. Um, it also talks about absorption of infrared, okay? So black is a really good infrared absorber, and also a really good infrared emitter. White doesn't absorb it that well, but also doesn't emit it that well. Visible light, you use to see. Ultraviolet, you can use, um, like, a security. Okay? So when you think of, like, uh, UV light, you know, that kind of purpley light, and you can see it all glow. Um, X-rays, fine enough, X-rays. Gamma rays is kind of a high energy radiation. That's the same as the gamma rays from, um, you know, that is the gamma from gamma radiation. Um, you can use it in radiotherapy to like um, kill cancer cells. Okay. Yes, so that is, that is, how, we, that is how we discovered it. I'll very quickly show you that. Um, so I've drawn, the, I've drawn the rainbow here 
because if I take the rainbow into visible light, okay, um, the longest wavelength of visible light is red, and then you end up all the way in, in uh, you know, in ultraviolet or whatever, right? In violet. Now, what um, I think is Herschel, I think Herschel discovered it. What he did is he took a he, he took um, a, a, a rainbow, a prism, okay, and he took a thermometer and he put it at different points on the rainbow. So he looked at the temperature, if you like, of each color. And what he did is just for the bands, he put it a little bit too far on the right, and he noticed that the temperature here went up more than the red. So he deduced that there was this kind of other light, which he couldn't see, which was giving it heat. And that was infrared, which as you can see, is kind of further on from visible. Right, um, that is waves. Uh, anything else that uh, people would like me to go through? Okay, it's request time. Magnetism, dumb magnetism. Uh, national grids and electricity. We're not doing national grid. Uh, practical is a good idea. So um, there's two practicals to do waves. Okay. Um, there's two practicals to do waves. The first one is kind of what I briefly did, uh, described there, which is where you take um, a conical flask. Okay. Um, and one of them has listened to too much Rolling Stones and has painted it black. Okay, um, another one. Okay, it's just normal. Another one. Uh, they painted white, or you can also silver it so it's shiny. Okay, and uh, what you did, what I did, um, is you is you can put the thermometer in. Okay, you can fill up with water. Right, you put the thermometer in. Okay, there's two ways of doing this practical. You either um, heat, uh, use boiling water, put it in there, okay, and you can see how quickly it cools down. Or you can uh, put it in there, uh, shine like a heat source on it and see how quickly it heats up. And the key thing here is that this one here will, uh, it will heat up quickest. And it will also cool down quickest because um, what it will do is um, is black is a really good emitter of infrared radiation and also a really good absorber of infrared radiation um, yeah over here um, the kind of the shininess reflects a lot of infrared radiation so it's really um, slow to heat up but it also cools down the slowest as well uh, yes, I do watch Love Island. Um, I mean, the video just talking about how at least this will be better than Tommy's starter that he served, I think, as a leave or whatever um, from last night. Um, the other practical um, that we have in this topic is the ripple tank. Now, uh, yeah, it's always saved. I don't unsave it. Um, is the ripple tank. Now, this is a stupid piece um, of apparatus where you kind of get a tank, right? And uh, you fill it. Um, with water. Okay, and what you do is you make waves in the water and um, what you can do is take a light up the top and shine the light on the tank so, right and if I take a kind of look underneath where there's kind of a so imagine that's the wave pattern in the ripple tank. So it's like that, it's looking like that, right? Where there's a peak, there's more water for the light to shine through, right? So that means it's gonna be a dark patch. So you get like kind of a dark 
line like this, a shadow. Then where it's the bottom of a wave, there's less water to go through, so it'll be quite light. And then I'll get another shadow, another shadow, another shadow, like this. Now, the problem is, is because waves are moving, okay, um, because the waves are moving, um, you, you'll you see that the, the shadow is moving, and that's quite difficult, okay? Um, so what you can do is light to shine on and off at the same rate as you generate waves. Now, a light which goes on and off really, really quickly is called a strobe. So what you can do is strobe flashes at the same frequency as the wave. Okay, we'll go wave, wave, flash, wave, flash, and you can see that the shadows won't move. I can then measure, say, four shadows. So that's four shadows, which means it's four white wavelengths. I can then take the frequency of the strobe, and then suddenly, okay, uh, so I divide that by four to get one wavelength. Why is it that I measured more than one? Well, that's because it makes the error less, okay? So if I measure 10 wavelengths, divide by 10, a tenth um, of um, the error. So that's why you measure multiple and divide that. Um, so I can then take the wavelength and the frequency and I can, um, I can measure uh, the wave by using frequency times wavelength. So that's like the perfect ripple tank. Um, yeah, this is what I'm now going to talk about. Okay, so sometimes the strobe will have the frequency on it. Okay, a uh, radiation was paid one, yeah. Uh, Brett, but uh, radiation's in the first one, don't worry about it. You can tell I'm a chemistry teacher, can you? Cool. I mean, I still did first year physics at university and ended up specialising in chemical physics. So I also did physics. If you can solve that. Okay. In Cambridge, you take uh, this and you don't have a strobe, you just have a light on. And then you time, so you start your stopwatch and uh, you time how many waves go past in a minute. Okay, so you can see that, um, you know, uh, that's another way of getting the frequency, basically. So you can make the wavelength in the same way, okay? And then all you do is you time how many waves go past each second, and then you can, um, so you count the number of waves, you divide it by the time, and then that will give you the frequency, and I can put the frequency in there in the same way, okay? Um, so that's a little bit more difficult but also a little bit more easy because you don't have to worry about the strobe thing. Right, the ripple tank practical is really annoying, okay? The key thing here is that the shadow the shadow bits are the peak. The trial one, you get the actual gain. That's the peaks, okay? And then you can measure it and do the wavelength. Okay, that's the practicals uh, for waves. Um, you do not, if you're doing foundation, you do not need to know the formulas of heart, okay? Um, Okay, the last one is force. Now, if we look at the practicals in forces, okay. Okay, if we look at the forces practicals, uh, you've got the acceleration practical, okay. What I mean there is, is that's usually performed with a trolley, okay, and a rope and a pulley. And what you do is you hang different masses on the pulley, okay, and that gives you different forces. You then take a, a light gate here and you measure the acceleration, okay. So you'll see, okay, that um, by varying the amount, the force on here, so that changes the force, and measuring the acceleration you'll see that essentially you, uh, you generate F equals MA, which is uh, Newton's uh, second law. Okay. Um, so the acceleration practical is a bit vague, a bit mean, but if you use uh, F equals MA, um, that is uh, kind of the main thing. Um, the other main practical to do with forces 
is uh, the hook door practical. And that's where we uh, take a clamp stand. Right, um, you put a spring in it, like that, okay, and uh, you see how um, the uh, you hang different masses and you measure the length of the spring and um, and uh, work out the extension. So you take uh, your clamp stand, you hang a spring. Put a mass on it, okay. You measure the original length, okay, and um, then you get the extension. So, uh, extension is what you're actually after, and that is a uh, new length minus non stretched length. Okay. Um, if you then plot a graph of uh, force against extension, okay, you'll see it's a nice straight line. Now, that's, that's actually used that to teach Hooke's law. Okay, um, so uh, Robert Hooke is uh, um, he's kind of remembered as a person that Isaac Newton hated. Um, don't know if he's nice, don't know if he's mean, but the problem is, is when one of the most famous scientists who ever lived hates you, you tend to get a bad rep, okay? Um, so, um, what the hook noticed is that if I look at the force applied to a spring, he noticed that that was proportional, i.e. it goes up at the same rate as the extension. Now, hopefully in maths, you're familiar with the idea for if, if something is proportional, remember that fish symbol, you can actually write that as equals, and then this thing here is what we call a constant of proportionality. And that's in maths. If you don't know that, um, don't worry about it, okay? So what he did is he saw that the force and extension were proportional, and he looked at a constant and he called this the spring constant. Okay. So he noticed that no matter what the spring, that if I plot a graph. Oh no, is it all gone? Is it all frozen? Is it all gone weird? Let's bring this back from the first one. Right. <clears throat> um, so, you notice that now uh, for every spring, the force applied to the spring is proportional to the extension and it's proportional by something called the spring constant. Now, this is a measure of the stiffness of the spring. So if you have a really stiff spring, your high spring constant, you have a really um, kind of stretchy spring, you have a really low spring constant. Um, and that just maybe makes sense if you put some numbers in. Okay, If I say the force was four, if the spring constant was a really big number, then that means the extension would be really small. So if I pick the spring constant as eight, that means that the extension will have to be a half, because eight times a half equals four. If I pick a really low number, so say one, that means the extension will be four, because one times four is four. So the spring constant of the spring, okay? Um, it hasn't frozen again, okay? That's probably just my lag. Um, so if I look at a graph, okay, and if I plot a uh, force here and extension, it'll be a nice straight line. 
Now, the one extra thing with Hooke's Law is that you can get something like this, okay? Now, clearly, something weird has happened, okay? Something weird has happened, okay? Now, that's because Hooke's Law only applies when something is what we call elastic. That means that um, if I release the force, it goes back to back exactly to its original length. Now, at this point, you have um, this point limit, okay? So down here, okay, where it's a straight line, the, the spring is being elastic. Over here, it has permanently deformed, okay? Now, um, that is kind of like, um, um, you know, if you stretch the spring too far, when I release it, it doesn't go back to its original length. So the key thing here, is that um, the curve bit means that you have got some de deformation as part of this elastic limit. Okay, that's uh, something else that I'm gonna look at. Um, something else that I'm gonna look at is uh, Newton's laws, okay. Um, he said uh, the first law is um, that uh -huh. an object will remain in um, at rest unless acted by force. And what that means is that essentially, if I look at the forces, they can either be balanced or they can be unbalanced on an object. Okay. Now, if the forces are balanced. That means two things. The object is either stationary, that means it is not moving, or it is moving at a constant speed. Now, I found this really difficult to get my head around when I uh, first studied this, okay? Um, uh, this um, was all to do with the fact that, um, this is all to do with the fact that, uh, oh, it's not all to do with the fact, I'm just saying random rubbish. Um, if I take a skydiver, right, um, he falls down and then his air resistance will balance his weight, okay, and will reach the point where the forces are balanced. Now, he doesn't suddenly stop and hover in midair. He's not stationary. He just continues down towards um, the earth, okay, at a constant speed. So um, the other way of thinking about it is stationary, i.e. being still, is a constant speed of zero. So whenever you have a balanced force, you have a constant speed, okay? Now, unbalanced form, okay? Unbalanced get some form of acceleration. Now, that could be a change in speed, right? So that could be that um, it speeds up or it slows down. Or it could be a change in direction. And that's because acceleration is what we call a vector quantity. It matters about direction. So if I was to give you an example, and this, this type of thing always um, comes up. If I take uh, like this trolley or something, and I have this way in 50 newtons this way, um, that means that the overall, what we call resultant force would be 50 newtons. Now it will then say, describe the motion of this trolley. And the key thing to say would be that accelerates to the right. Because I've got an unbalanced force, that means that there is going to be an acceleration. Do not say it moves to the right. Because bear in mind, it could be going at a constant speed to start off with. And then when these forces get involved, it's an acceleration. So whenever you get unbalanced forces, you need to really be thinking about Okay, Newton's second law. is what we've just done with the practical and the trolleys. That's F equals MA, i.e. that the acceleration, what he did is he, first of all, he said that if you have an unbalanced force, you're gonna have an acceleration. He then said that that acceleration is directly um, influenced by what we call the mass. Now, you might have heard what someone asked earlier about inertia. Well, that's basically what that M is. It's what's called inertial mass. It's, the, it's this kind of mass which uh, resists things getting faster. So 
Um, that's just using that equation. Basically says that the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. Okay, and the bigger the object, the more mass it has, the less the acceleration. And the last law that he had was, funny enough, his third law. Okay, and that says that for every action, you have equal and opposite reaction. Okay, so if I have a book on a table, okay, uh, I have the weight of the book going down, and I also have a reaction force going up. And that's good because uh, the forces must balance. Otherwise, the book would be accelerating through the table into the earth, and it doesn't do that. Okay. It is, yeah. Well, if you actually think about it, uh, Newton's first and second law are exactly the same thing. Newton's second law is just putting maths to it, okay? So um, I thought I would bring in inertia in the second law because that M is what we refer to as that. Before. Right, now we've got, uh, well, Five, ten minutes left. Has anyone got anything that they would like me to go through? It is, but I'm talking more in general. Again, I'm a teacher. Um, anyone? Uh, well, the thing is, is uh, yeah, you don't need physics, but it also counts towards your science uh, grades. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's crack out a paper. Let's do a couple of these questions. That is, um, we don't, we're not doing triple. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, so here. Um, the student investigated acceleration using gliders and air track and light gates. The air track reduces friction between the glider and the track to zero. The glider was released from rest and moved along the track. The mass holder hit the ground before the car had passed through the second light gate. Which statements describe the effect this would have on the glider? Okay, now it's moving um, and suddenly that mass drops off. Now, um, what that means is, um, is the force pulling that thing has suddenly gone down to zero. Okay. Now, because that force has gone to zero, okay, so the result force has gone to zero. Technically, it would have done resistance, but it's clearly in this case, because we're talking about friction, and air resistance in this case would be negligible. So um, the resistance force is going the other way, have gone down. The force has suddenly gone away because the mass holder has hit the bottom. Now, because the force has gone away, Remember, F equals MA. If F is a zero, that means that A is zero as well. So that means that the acceleration is also zero. Okay. Uh, 7.2. The mass holder should not hit the ground before the car passes through the second light gate. So that's one way the student could stop this happening. Uh, so there's two things. We could either use a, short, a shorter spring. Uh, string so it doesn't hit the ground quicker or you can put the bench higher or you can put the light gate closer together those are the three things okay soon increase the resultant force acting on the glider by adding more mass to the mass holder okay um she calculated the acceleration um of the glider for each resultant force uh, the test was done three times okay table two shows the results Let's go old school. Uh, table two shows the results. Okay, um, here, okay, the resultant force is uh, 0 0.2, um, and so on and so forth. Now, actually, I don't like that. I'm gonna go back to that, I'm not quite as, as bright. Okay, um, now, two mistakes. First of all, um, here you can see, if, if I'm looking at the weird stuff, Okay, this thing here clearly stands out to me. So the mistake is that they uh, they didn't uh, round uh, the mean to two significant figures. I'm, I'm writing really scruffily and quick there. Okay, so I apologise for that. Okay, um, that's because um, 
all your measurements were done. That's the world's shortest siren outside my window. Um, or like, uh, yeah, anyway. So um, because these measurements are done to two significant figures, I must um, round my mean to two significant figures. The other error, and this um, is really, uh, really common, is they loved as an anomaly. You can see here, 6.4, 7.2, 4. So um, the other mistake is that they included um, an anomaly in their mean. Okay, that's not that's not good. Okay. Um, has anyone got anything else desperately? Because I don't think um, I don't think the paper's the, the funnest thing to do. Um, has anyone got any last minute things before I go? Now's your last chance. Refraction, again, that's true. Um, uh, actually, no, refraction isn't, but the refraction um, calculations or like the idea that thing um, is. Now let's look at the refraction. Um, right, so uh, taking uh, this but up here is going to be water and this down here is going to be air. Now I'm going to take my pen as, uh, as a wave, right? So here it is, it's moving towards there. Now um, the first thing to know about why refraction happens is that um, things uh, light will, uh, in a more dense medium will travel more slowly. Okay, so um, what happens is it's going to move forwards. Okay, now when it when this pen lid, okay, which is the end of my wave, hits the water, it's now going to move slower. So it's now going to move slower, but this still in the fast air, so that's going to move faster. Okay, this bit's moving slowly, remember, moving faster, 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 and boom, it carries on forwards. Okay, so what we've got. That's one of the worst diagrams I think I've ever done. Right? Is we've got a that's awful. That's shocking. And um, you've got a bending of light, okay? You've got a bending of light by the fact that so refraction. I hate these pins. Um so uh, refraction. Okay, is uh, the uh, change uh, in uh, direction of light, okay, um, because of a change in speed. Okay, that is shocking. Um, uh, the last uh, you have someone else to talk about stopping distance. Um, so stopping distance is made of two things. Okay, that is uh, a combination of thinking uh, dis and breaking distance. Okay. Um, stopping distance uh, is the whole thing in total. Thinking distance is how long it takes for you to react to the need to uh, stop. And braking is the time it takes for your actual car to either hit the brakes and the time it takes to dissipate that kinetic energy so you uh, your velocity or your speed comes to zero. So you think about braking, i.e. you have to react, then you apply the brakes. Those two together is uh, the stopping distance. And you can affect it in two things, okay? The thinking distance is anything which affects you personally as a human. So things like uh, drugs, your tired, um, alcohol, uh, anything like that. Um, the braking distance uh, is affected by anything which is kind of like a physical condition of the road or your car. So um, that's why both things uh, are kind of affected. Now, last thing, because some of you, someone said about the, uh, the different equations. Now, I'm actually going to put the kind of title card back on. Okay, these are 
on here, equations are every single um, every single uh, equation which is on the equation sheet which you need to remember for paper two. So f equals kx or f equals ke, that's Hooke's law. We've talked about that. At w equals mg, weight equals mass times gravitational field strength. Um, uh, momentum equals mass times velocity, that's higher tier only. Um, F equals MA, we talked about that, that's Newton's second law. Um, Transformers is not in trilogy, no. Um, w equals FS, so that's work equals force times distance. It's work done equals force times distance. Um, that's more paper one, but they do like to have it come in. Um, uh, S equals, uh, one see, speed equals distance divided by time. And um, here, that triangle means change, so uh, acceleration equals change in speed over time. Very often, that's written as um, final velocity v minus initial velocity u divided by time. Okay, and uh, v equals uh, free, velocity, um, sp speed equals um, frequency times wave length we've also talked about. Okay, I think that's as good as time as any to, uh, to stop. Um, if you stuck around for the whole thing, thank you. If you stuck around for all of the five I think I did in the end, uh, thank you, because uh, it's not been too bad. It's been annoying at points, but, you know, it's been all right. Um, thank you, and uh, good luck tomorrow.